Hi, welcome to HIMSS 2015. I'm Kathy Berger for Health Data Management, and I'm here with Dr. Christopher Matthews, Z Omega's Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer, and Nandini Rangaswamy, Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer with Z Omega. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to be looking at some of the issues around population health management and health information exchanges. So Nandini, can you start talking about some of the challenges, the key challenges that healthcare organizations have faced in their efforts to adopt population health management principles? Population health management is such a broad term that I think the first challenge for a lot of these organizations is in actually defining what that means. Uh, for an organization that's completely oriented towards a fee-for-service model, maybe it may be baby steps in uh, taking very small uh, bits of risk. Maybe it is in a bundle payment for in a certain narrow set of services, or it could be a very broad-based vision of setting up an ACO that takes the entire risk on a panel of patients. So I think the first key challenge is actually defining what PHM means to that uh, particular organization. And of course, once the definition is there, uh, typically organizations see challenges in two other areas. It's around people and processes. How do you change them to adopt to the new goals? And then, of course, the technology solutions that make it happen. Along those lines, uh, information sharing and data management are the foundations of effective population health management. What are some of the key data aggregation and integration issues that have to be addressed as part of an effective PHM strategy? To me, uh, data integration and aggregation is one of the fundamental uh, cornerstones of PHM, if you will, uh, because one of there is, there is really no other way to drive value-based care or to deliver the right care to the right person at the right time until you know what's happening with that individual. And the key to making that happen is to aggregate data on that individual across the entire care continuum. It could be data coming in from an EMR, uh, from a physician facility you visited, maybe from the claim system from the payers, labs, diagnostics, you name it. It could also be sitting in unstructured data in the form of notes, be it in you know, lab systems or in some of the EMRs. So at its core, you know, the data is not only integrated, but how do you aggregate it and make sense of it? How do you know that John Doe who went to this clinic here is the same John Doe who landed up in the ER two weeks later? To be able to rationalize that and make sense that it is information on the same patient or the same individual. And then the third aspect of uh, data integration and aggregation is all, all around eliminating redundancies, duplicates, and assigning accuracies. So a patient self-reported data on labs how much weight do you want to assign it as opposed to a lab feed that's really talking about the same lab test. These are all core concepts that organizations really need to nail down because that is a fundamental driver for driving actionable intelligence that ultimately forms the basis of all PHM programs. What are some of the other critical success factors that go into a successful population health management strategy? I would say a population health management strategy is um, at its core a transformational initiative. It is not something you um, envision on day one, implement it, and you're done. Uh, to me, it is a journey for any organization that's embarking on the journey of PHM has to identify its short-term goals and long-term goals. Um, alluding to the example earlier, a short-term goal may be to prevent readmits, bring the readmission rate down, but the broader, longer-term goal may be to take full risk on the entire panel of patients they serve. So once you have that, then, Part of the population health management strategy is selection of those technologies, those program designs and governance mechanisms that allow you to implement that over time. So at its core, whether you are looking at workflow capability, whether you are looking at analytics capabilities, consumer and patient engagement capabilities, what have you, the technologies themselves must be flexible to adopt that over time, and then your people and processes must be flexible to adopt that over time. To me, such transformational initiatives are are going to be successful only when you have these two in place, but more, most importantly, the senior leadership commitment. You know, without senior leadership commitment, it's really hard to uh, accomplish an initiative of this scale. Dr. Matthews, what are the clinical implications of, of some of these trends uh, that we've been talking about? Uh, can you provide any examples of how this is playing out? Nandini really is referring to these transformational uh, innovations for practice management and for clinicians, hospital uh, providers, etc. This is a dramatic change in how care has been delivered historically. We're used to 
just in time, acute care, medicine, patient self-activation. And with this new approach, what we have to do is rethink, as providers, how we care for a population of patients. So many of the things that Nandini described really upend the practice of medicine in a way that we've never, ever seen before. And that starts with ensuring that you expand your care team. You have members of the care team that perhaps you've not utilized before or even had on your team. There's case managers, care coordinators, social workers, pharmacists, etc. And each one of those members of the care team now needs this actionable intelligence that Nandini refers to so that they can really practice to the limits of their licensure and that they have the workflows and things they need to, for success. This is a completely different style of medical practice than we've ever seen before.